Kenneth McFarlane, the Dean of American Speakers, who was certainly one of my heroes, said it best. If you're addressing an audience, say something of interest to you and your audience. Say it well and stop. And when you have finished, your audience should be able to answer the question, what are you saying and how do you know it? Welcome to Create Your Keynote. Powerful presentations, whoever your audience is, whether it's formal or informal, need certain ingredients. Scintillating content, that is saying something that is interesting. A strong structure. The structure helps you remember it and also the audience. One of the questions we frequently get is, how do I remember my speech? If it is not well structured, it will be a lot more complicated to remember it. Specific scripting, certainly at the beginning, at the end. We are always going to be the most nervous at the beginning. And I have many corporate clients who know this speech inside out. When they're in my office, when they're walking with their spouses, when they're on the treadmill or driving to work. And then I say, before you go to your big audience, let's go and run it through 20 of your employees. And one of my first clients I talked about yesterday, he knew that so well, he walked out blank. This is why rehearsing by yourself is great. Rehearsing for a target audience or even a support group is a great prep for going live. Start and close with an impact. The opening 30 seconds and the last 30 seconds are very important. It sets the flavor and closes on a high. Your stories have to be memorable, and there are plenty of sessions at Lady and the Champs and everywhere on stories. A keynote speech is probably known for having good examples. A keynote speech introduces ideas at a higher level of abstraction. You have a learning principle tied with a story. In a breakout session or a training session or a two-day course, you are, of course, driving deeper. You have to have the discipline to deliver it dynamically, which means Build rehearsal into your everyday life. When you're walking, when you're driving, at the dinner table. If you want your presentation to sound conversational, practice it conversationally. And often with my speaker friends, at the dinner table, I'll say, do you use that story in your seminars? No. The stories that you entertain your friends with at the dinner table need to go in your presentation. You will find many business professionals and speakers, they are much more entertaining with their friends than they ever are in front of an audience. A speech is not a conversation. It needs to sound conversational, however more tightly, specifically scripted. For example, in a conversation, we are going back and forth. Nothing is planned. I don't know what Walt's going to ask me. I don't know what example I'm going to give. This isn't planned. And when it is a conversation, you say words like things and non-specific. Your sentences are too long. You start sentences you don't finish. You use that horrible sloppy language, which I don't even in casual conversation, but people do a bunch of this or, or gobs of that. This is not performance language. So what we take is the conversational style However, edited, more specific. Shorter sentences and phrases. You speak more in a rhythm, and of course you pause 
to let people laugh or think. As counterintuitive as it sounds, you actually connect to your audience more when you pause. That is when they have the chance to internalize what they heard. The three key elements in any presentation of any sort, formal, informal, when your audience is five or 5,000, that is, of course, the content, what it is you are discussing, your expertise, your life experience. The structure, the simple structure of how you put it together. And you hear a lot about the, the champs talking about the Fripp speech structure. Now, I promise you, most presentation books will talk about organizing your speech. I had just never seen a diagram before, so we created it. And then, of course, there's the delivery. Many of my clients, all speakers, say, Fripp, I've got my speech. I just want you to work on my delivery. To which I say, why would you want to perfect a poorly structured, badly scripted presentation? So perhaps you are getting $15,000. Perhaps you are the best leader in your company. Let us, before we work on your delivery, just look at how do you structure? What are you now saying? If it's perfect, that's fine. However, I have never found anybody of any level, including Hall of Fame keynote speakers and top business presenters, that we did not rework this structure and scripting before. And when you have a logical structure, when you can hold the overview of what your speech looks like in your mind, the delivery will be easier. The idea is you know it so well you can forget it and then you can focus on the audience. When you know the structure, if you are in a circumstance, for example, senior management, they do not ask questions the way you might say an audience, I would invite your questions after we've been through the content. Senior management ask you whenever they want to. You need to always be able to go back to where you were. And you also need, especially if you are interactive in a relatively short session as this is, you need to know where you are in your presentation so that you can say, we need to now continue, otherwise you're not going to finish. <coughs> you develop a speech. This is my very creative friend, Brian Walter. And he says, you, de you develop a speech. Yes, you're going to sit down at some point and put all your thoughts into a logical structure and start rehearsing. However, you're always getting ideas. And when people ask, Fripp, how long does it take you to create your keynote? Well, you might have been thinking about it, noodling, working through ideas, taking notes, collecting ideas for months. And then you sit down and put it together. So it is really difficult to say how long you spend on it. Is it a new speech? Are you adapting or personalizing a presentation that you've given before? However you start, if this is going to be either a content speech or a motivational speech or a life speech, always start at the beginning. And what I talk about is start with a once upon a time technique. That is because every fairy story always starts with once upon a time. Start at the beginning. Yesterday's keynote speech, this was exactly what I did. I started at the beginning. Childhood, basic habits, values. Then come to America. 
How the hairdresser slowly went to Dale Carnegie, Toastmaster, got an interest at speaking. Then when you are getting more serious and your focus and learning from the experts and the coaches. Now, can you see the speech structure was a timeline. Act one in Fripp's life. Act two in Fripp's life. Act three in Fripp's life. Now, when you deliver this, just as with a movie, you can start at the beginning, you can start in the middle, you can start at the end. You see all these approaches in movies, you can with your speech. However, when you are developing it, you always start with a timeline. You don't have to put every part in However, you do have to have more content to pick from than you have time to give. And then how do you get from one timeline to the next? With one of my clients, the, the gentleman, his wife called and said, I want to buy you for my husband for his birthday. He was a multimillionaire. However, he grew up raised by his grandmother. He was a milkman in his early 20s. And now he's a multimillionaire. Now, everybody knew this. And what you need to do, if you are a multimillionaire or outrageously successful, the same principle I use in one of my corporate clients or their new executives always give a storyline of their life for the company so everyone gets a backstory on them. And what I do every time, especially for people who feel nervous, I don't like talking about myself. What you do is you make heroes of the people who taught you what you now know that be helped you become the expert or the leader or the multimillionaire. For example, with my executive, his first hero and the first chunk of his life, his grandmother was the hero who raised him. He didn't meet his father, he was 12 years old, he was an illegitimate child. The second chunk and his second hero was when he was a milkman, thinking on top of the world because he'd finished work by the time he was having breakfast. And the company hired a management consultant, and he realized this man has more potential, and he was more interested, so we gave him advice. And the third mentor in the third chunk of his life was a mentor who became his adopted father. Therefore, the three chunks of his life that developed him, other people were the heroes. It's a lot easier to talk about your success when you're giving credit to the people who taught you. And the transition line from one chunk to the next was fast forward seven years. And I said to him, because there are parts you miss out. You don't mention a wife you're no longer married to. <laughs> now, of course, m many of my clients, I would say, please tell me you're still married to a childhood sweeter. Because women in the audience do not like it if men become outrageously successful and dump the wife who paid for them to go to college. Now, if you, in fact, aren't married to that wife, when you talk about your wife, you talk about your wife as if it was the same one. And as Darren says, you have to be emotionally true. You don't have to give all the details. <laughs> Does it add to or distract from your message? That's it. Keynote content, because your life your presentation is what you know. So you need to challenge yourself and then create your keynote. This is what we're doing when you are, we ask all the questions. What do you know? Now, if you remember from yesterday's presentation, you say, why are memories of worth 
a fortune are because they remind us of who taught us our values, what is most important, when do we feel most exhilarated, and how do we know what we know? This is the foundation for your speech. What do you know? How do you know it? Now, isn't this exactly what Kenneth MacFarlane said in 1978? An audience needs to know what you know and how you know it. Who taught you to give credit? How does a hairstylist become a Hall of Fame keynote speaker on the front cover of Speaker Magazine? With no real talent. <laughs> you heard about all the pe good work habits, but you heard about all the people that helped. Review your life in stages. Young coming to America. America getting into speaking. Speaking getting to the next level, just the same as yours. Who were your influencers? How do you know what you know? Now, how many times from the champs have you heard say in dialogue, Bill Gove? What are your biggest challenges? I mean, there are many people in our audiences, myself included, you leave a country, you go to another continent alone. I was 20, no job, nowhere to live. Didn't know anyone, $500. Nido Quibain, if you've heard Nido, the most magnificent speaker and president of High Point University, he came over from Lebanon, couldn't speak English, $50. I always say, that was my problem. I had $450 too much. <laughs> Maybe I would be the multi-millionaire that Nido is, yeah. What were the toughest choices? Now, you notice if anyone comes on stage and we coach them, and the question is, have you ever, I always change it to, how often have you? Because it's, if, if this is a challenge people frequently have, aren't they more interested in how to solve it than, oh, once I had that problem. No, you frequently have this challenge or problem. Now the answer is more valuable. Subtle, but amazing in the impact. What is your greatest success? What's the best advice you give to your friends? Now you realize people will pay you for that advice. What did the president of the personnel company say? Do you coach? Oh, if you're my friends, I wish I was one of your friends. Can you see? how the principles go behind what you saw yesterday. Once you develop your ideas, what is going in this speech, we all have different processes. I personally believe in our iPad texting world that a pad of paper in a coffee shop do you realize how many great speeches have been written in dark, smoky bars on a soggy cocktail napkin? <laughs> because when you're relaxed and stimulated music around people, often you get your best ideas. Now, perhaps you work best alone, listening to classical music. It doesn't matter, but usually, it's not necessarily when you got your computer and you're in your office all organized. Now, when you put it together, you want to be somewhere organized, but the creative process, who knows? You might be sitting in a concert exhilarated by the music and then you get an idea, write it down. So it's the scraps of paper, it's your notepad that you carry in your, in your pocket or your briefcase or your handbag, it's the soggy cocktail napkin, you put it together, then, if you, your handwriting's as bad as mine, 
You just put it in a Word file. Then when you're putting together the speech, a flip chart. The biggest mistake my corporate clients make, and the first question you ask is, how do you put together your presentations? Well, I get out the deck of PowerPoint slides. No, 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 PowerPoint is tidy. You know I love PowerPoint. But that is the end of the creative process, not the beginning. Because then, now you might take your flip chart and just put your key ideas and post-its. And as you're standing up talking through, say, well, no, you know, really this story comes better there. That example comes there. Then, when you've got your outline, then I put, I put a rough draft of my PowerPoint slides together. Of course, send it to my associate who adds the bells and whistle. Oh, Patricia, I love the video. I love the music. How do you do that? I don't know. <laughs> you pay people. You pay people because your time is worth. Do what you do best. I would rather you pay someone to put together your PowerPoint while you're rehearsing how do you deliver your stories. What do you say when you turn your PowerPoint off? That's where you need to be spending your time. Now, every presentation is built around a premise, a central theme, a big idea. This is why I ask my clients, if you had one sentence, what would you say? If you cannot explain it simply, you might not understand it. Your audience won't get it. If I say, what is your presentation about? One sentence. I'll give you two. I'll give you three. If you answer in a paragraph, it won't be clear enough. When my career was mostly keynote speaking, a lot of the times, clients would hire me to attend the entire conference and then do not only a closing speech, but review all the key ideas that had been heard. And I, of course, was all prepared from, this was a banking conference, everything that happened the day before. There was a speaker right before me, Richard Putts, and he was giving a two-hour program, and then I was getting up right after and had to review his presentation. So I said, can you tell me as simply as possible what your two-hour presentation is about? He said, collaboration. I said, that is a man who understands his subject. One word for two hours, collaboration. Think about your next, pres think about your next presentation. How long do you have to speak? Who is the audience? What is your subject matter? And now see how you would design the premise. Often, and you've heard me in some of my, in my sessions say, my premise is. Yesterday, I did not state my premise. I said, welcome to Fifty Shades of Frit. You will hear of observations made, advice received, experiences lived. You knew how you were going to get it. I hope you walked away knowing that the premise of the speech was, although I did not say it, you don't have to be the best or the most brilliant. You just have to have exceptionally good work habits, become indispensable, and you will attract good teachers and coaches. Now, some of my friends say, can I ask your advice? I say, no, because you haven't taken the last advice I gave you that was very good. No, you don't get any more. <laughs> Not for free, you don't. Now, now, you see, we laugh at that, but in your own life. Oh, what did you learn from Lady and the Champs? I'm not telling you because you never gave back the CD I lent you in Darren's last speech. Where's your commitment? Do you have an interest in? Everyone has an interest in. Do you have a commitment to? It's the people that have the commitment to that we're willing to help. 
and you just work more, you practice more, you rehearse more than everybody else. Because I have friends who are a lot more talented than I am. However, they are lazy. They took their natural talent for granted. Discipline, not an end in itself, but a means to an end. My brother, who I, who I quote frequently, his company is called Discipline. And I spoke to him this morning, and there is an exceptionally good chance he will be here next year. Internationally acclaimed rock and roll guitarist. According to Rolling Stone magazine, the 42nd best guitarist in the history of the world, living or dead. And do not think ring rock star. He is the most analytical, modest, shy, brilliant, articulate philosopher you'll probably ever meet. Without my personality, I have to protect him. <laughs> All right, so the dictionary definition. The dictionary definition of a premise is a basis of argument leading to a conclusion. This is all in your handout, so don't worry. This is how this is interpreted to your next speech. This is a simple premise formula. Even if you do not state it, as I did not exactly in yesterday's speech, this is the premise formula you fill out for every speech. If you give the same speech multiple times and you always have to develop your basic core message that you personalize, this is how you focus on this audience. Every dot, dot, dot means we're going to fill in the blank. Can the subject of your talk, and it could be slash result. How? So for example, if I said, Jeff, every doctor can, with your audience, you'd say how. Every doctor can double their practice and have healthier patients. Oh, I want to do that how. The one, two, three, four points of wisdom is the foundation of your structure. The premise of this session is every lady in the chat attending. Now, whatever your next upcoming speech is, you fill in who is the audience. Every lady in the champs in attendee can create your keynote faster than you think. How? By Mining your life for content, starting at the beginning. Designing your presentation focused on the audience, which is why the basic presentation, presentation skills for builders, might not be the same as presentation skills for doctors. It might not be the pres same as presentation skills for people who want to get paid. The content's the same, the personalizing and examples are different. Structuring your speech conversationally. A good presentation, if you sat down and had a conversation, I'd make a statement. You'd say, how? Can you give me an example? When did you know that? Well, how would I apply it? When you're delivering a presentation, whatever you say, you imagine what would the audience ask you if you were having at dinner. That's what they're thinking, and you answer their unstated questions. That's what I mean by logically. If you sit down and have a conversation, and they're asking you questions which doesn't lead to your next segment of content, maybe your presentation is structured. Little off track for the audience. Building rehearsal into your everyday life. You know that means talking, practicing at the dinner table. Now, this is the Fripp speech model, which you have probably seen multiple times. It's in your handout. 
you need a strong opening and a strong close. Yesterday, one of the sessions was about your options of openings. You do not necessarily write the opening of your presentation first. I recommend you always have in your back pocket some of your favorite techniques or actual openings. Always think, what is the audience thinking coming into this session based on your bio, the promo of the session, the event they were coming to, or your breakout session at the conference? You are going to introduce your premise, your central theme, after your opening, and remember, however you choose to open, it needs to logically transition in the premise. I do not recommend when people are coming in, you say, the subject of our presentation is how to design and deliver. One, you need to do something that invites them in. And let's face it, how often are people not actually all there at the beginning? If your premise is somewhat complex, and some of my clients, you can imagine, they have much more complex subjects than we speak about, that you have to give a story, a statistic, or an example that helps us see, us, see it, or understand it, or ponder the question that leads into the introduction of this is what we're going to be focusing on and why it's of importance to you. Then your points of wisdom, this is a talking point, or however you want to call it. Your, your, with one of my clients, Steve Savage, we made it his three savage strategies. So savage strategy one. Now you have eight. Eight. Eight, eight simple rules for getting the most out of your sales force. Eight simple rules for getting the most out of your sales force. So the first simple rule, the second simple rule, all right, so you put this together. Now, I would suggest with eight simple rules, depending on how long your presentation is, you're probably going to organize the two or three that go together into a chunk. But you introduce your ideas, and then you develop that talking point into a chunk of content. And we're going to look, dive in a bit deeper so you see how you can actually apply this, this speech model. Because the examples, the circles, sometimes the champs interpret it, and it can be three different stories. Let's just say your point was, give me a point in your speech. Uh, information is vital to good decision making. Okay, information is, is vital to good decision making. So, for example, in this company, what might be a company you would speak to or an industry? Um, a local government. Local government. All right. Now, so that is the first talking point. Now, give me three different areas within local government that the decisions are starting with low complexity decision. Um, understanding that you're having a crisis. A crisis. And, and who, who would have a crisis of three different levels? The individual that encounters the crisis. Okay, so the individual encounters the crisis, how would they look at it? Then who would they tell? The next level, usually the departments. Okay, then the departments. But can you see how you're looking at that one talking point from three different points? The person who finds the crisis, who they report to. It could be then who makes the decision to change or come up with budget that isn't planned or what happens. So you look at that crisis or that discovering the crisis three different ways. However you look at it, this is how you develop a chunk of content. You are always going to review your ideas. Now yesterday, how did I do that? So what's in it for you? And then Q&A. Let us just say, on, in some circumstances, you do not have questions. Then you might say, at this point, I am usually asked. Or, I am surprised nobody asked me. 
Or, I expected you to ask. Or perhaps you were too shy to ask. Always have your own questions in your back pocket. You can always say, last week in Cleveland, a woman in the second row asked, Patricia, what is our next logical step? Well, let's just imagine you gave this and you say, Lucian, what's my next logical step? Well, that depends. If these ideas of value, you can go back and present them to your senior leadership team. Or, if you would like to invite me in and get them on the, on the agenda, I would happily present them with you. Or, if you're not comfortable speaking in front of your senior management, if you can get me an appointment and introduce me, I'll do the presentation. What you are doing is answering their questions or putting the questions in their minds that you want them to be thinking about. How can they engage with you more? You can download the special report from my website. You can buy my book. You can come to my boot camp. Now let's look at different ways of how you fill in your chunks of content. You have your talking point, icon points of wisdom, whatever it could be. It could be the first sales point. Now perhaps you need to give an explanation of what you mean by that. Then an example of it and then an application. You might want to look at this historically. Now yesterday's speech really was here's the past, here's the present more of my business now, and then I even introduced the idea my brother said, what about memories of the future? the pre-event. And when you're in the creative process, this is where we get our vision of what's possible. I bet you are all exactly the same as me. <laughs> the amount of times I've said, if I knew it was going to be this much work, I would never have done it. But you get inspired by a vision of what you can create. The amount of seminars I have created, it's so much work to do once, which is why you record them. They can live on in your lives and cars forever. <laughs> they were so much work, it's a shame not to. But when you are talking, for example, I, uh, I talk a, a lot with sales teams. So I can say in the past, well, look at Troy. In the past, traditionally, your sales process was like this, or this is how you recruited salespeople. At the present, John tells me your strategies are this. However, as you look in the future, as Fred, the CEO, shared his goals, the strategies that have worked well in the past are no longer going to work for the future vision you have of your company. However, don't worry, these eight strategies are exactly what you need. See how it works? In the past, you were overweight and didn't exercise. At the present, you've incorporated. However, when you get into your 70s, you have to look at how do you stay vital as you look into your 80s and 90s. The audience mix. In every audience, usually there is some mix. I speak a lot, as you've heard many times, the American Payroll Association. Well, I have HR members, uh, payroll professionals, and IT professionals in the same audience. So you introduce your ideas, and you might say, for those who are in payroll, it applies this, HR this. Now, you don't have to adapt every single point to every audience. 
you do have to let the audience know, I know you are there, this applies to all of you. However, in your stories, Mary is a payroll professional, Joan is an HR professional. Now, they went down to talk to Kirk, who was the IT professional. You just make sure everyone knows, I know you are here, I am aware of you. Let's look at another way. If you are a speaker at a convention, our signature story, our knock-down, drag-out classic, my Larry Mariatini going into a dress shop for a pair of hose and ending up with the beaded evening dress, Darren's first on stage, the, your dream is not for sale, I mean, the, the tasting. These could be classic stories you're going to put in any speech. Then, that you hone. Then you go to the industry. So let's just say I'm, I'm, my story on sales is about retail. Good customer service is exceptionally good for sales. Now that principle, when you went to a restaurant, this is what the waitress did and said. Because they're in the hospitality industry. Now, with your chain, now, and this is where you become, well, beyond a mystery shopper, you actually interview people. You, you find out a story about one of their heroes. And I often say, when I'm talking about principle, who in your company demonstrates this? If everyone in your company was delivering the customer service that this person does, you wouldn't be talking to me about a training. Let me hear their story, and I actually interview them. Now, this might be a customized story for this company, but they come classics in your repertoire. I was speaking to the, the Employee Involvement Association. I said to the chairperson of the event from Sprint, do you have any success stories? She said, yeah, as a matter of fact, one of our one of our associates came up with a simple idea already made us more than $13 million. So what to say, who was it? What's her number? Can I call? So I call up Nancy Albertson and said, Nancy, just for my record, what's your title? She said, Patricia, I'm just a secretary. I guess you call me a big gal with big ideas. Do you realize that gives her a backstory and a personality? You already like her. Now, you could not write dialogue that good. <laughs> so this, can you see? Now, Nancy Albertson has been in articles and books and speeches for years. It started as a customized story for that group. That's how you build your repertoire. My, my personal story you heard yesterday, it's years since I did that. This was to show you how you can do whatever you like. My speeches are more about my clients and their examples. But that's how you become an industry expert. A worldview. Yesterday, I believe it was from center stage. I gave you a simple example how Chris, an SA member who was at Lady at the Champs, I said, you want to develop your speaking, you're, the financial, you're, you're a financial planner. Find your local APA chapter volunteer to speak. They liked it. They recommended her to the regional conference. Dan Maddox just happened to be there and said, we don't hire financial planners. You are so well-intentioned. I booked you for our national meeting. Can you see how this works? How you develop an idea with a specific example of how it can be developed. You adapt an idea. My, I started my business speaking about how to promote your business, high-tech, low-tech, no-tech. I really started speaking how to promote your business, how to get, keep, and deserve customers long before we dreamed about the internet. 
But you see, it developed the same idea of how I promoted my hairstyling business, then how my clients promoted their business, how it evolved as technology came into it. Now we'd be adding social media, which certainly wasn't in the conversation a few years ago. Your talking points might stay the same. They evolve as you, your business, your clientele, and the world evolves. Now you do a review. T.S. Eliot, who was a 1948 Nobel Prize winner in literature, said, when forced to work within a strict framework, the imagination is taxed to its utmost. Given total freedom, the work is likely to sprawl. Who amongst us has not heard from our speaker friends, oh, my message is inside me, I just stand up and let it come through me? That's who he was talking about. So whether it's writing a book, an article, or giving a speech, now, very often, you might have the luxury of having a two-day seminar. I still recommend your two-day seminar, although it will have more interaction, needs to be when you speak as tight as it would be for a keynote. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the essence, the basics of how you mine your life and you force it within a simple structure. My best advice is, as you are focusing on creating your keynote faster than you think, remember what our goal is. We want to put some, some of our ideas and expertise and experiences into our audience's minds that will then come out in their lives. Thank you for selecting this session.